Hi. I can't see anybody. I'm Elise Grinstein, member of the board of SciArc. I'm very glad to be here tonight. And I'm here to introduce Alex Smith, who was born in Los Angeles. She got her BA from um, the University of Irvine. And at that time, it was really hot. I mean, there was so much going on. And what was going on was these people were working there who have really changed our idea of what art's about. Bob Irwin was teaching. Chris Burden was there, along with Alex. Via Selmans, Ed Moses, Bruce Nauman. I mean, it was just a really hot time. Uh, she received the keys to the city, Grand Rapids, Michigan, in 1983. Margie feels that's really important. My first recollection of Alex was about 1971 when I visited the studio. It's the same storefront where she is now, frosted windows, lots of good stuff around. I was given a pair of white gloves, table and chair with a stack of art on it. The art was each sheet which had either a drawn or collaged image and a text that was seemingly unrelated to the image. The text seemed to come from maybe 50s headlines, uh, Kerouac or Chandler, Raymond, not Otis. And it gives us insights on how we think, how we live, and our identity about the collective American unconscious. She talks about our wistfulness as Americans, our notions of purpose, destiny, and progress. I think that's probably where Kerouac comes in, that kind of movement. Her work from then till now has changed, as have we all. And that will be her subject for tonight from Walt Whitman, one of Alex's faves, my picture gallery. In a little house, I keep pictures suspended. It's not a fixed house. It is round. It's only a few inches from one side to the other. Yet behold, it has room for all the shows of the world, our memories. I'm happy to present Alex Smith. Thank you, Elise. I bet you guys haven't had very many speakers who have the key to Grand Rap the key to the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, let's see you will eventually find out what I had to do to get it. Um, let's see, oh, I can't see anybody. Just a little bit strange. Um, I usually, um, when I give a slide lecture, I usually concentrate on some of the things that Elise was talking about, which are basically sort of the, um, the content aspects of my work, but I thought it would be more interesting tonight to um, to look at some of the um, some of the wide ranging sort of forms that I've worked in, and um, I've always had a sort of um, formal schizophrenia, and <clears throat> in the sense that I've always done very um, ephemeral paper collage works, and I've always done spatial sort of installation works, and I've always done things that were really temporary, and I've always been attracted by things that were really permanent. Um, so we're going to look at some of this, um, some of these sort of dichotomies. Um, I graduated from, um, from University of California at Irvine in 1970, which seems like a million years ago, and I've been um, showing for maybe, I don't know, 25 years. So I have um, a lot of work in a lot of different sort of areas that we could um, take a look at. So I'm going to just show you very few slides of my 
early pieces, and then I'm going to um, start looking at things a little more seriously in about 1981, which is when I started making forays sort of out of the studio and into the world, into the real world in uh, the form of public art. So, and I think that's something to be a little bit more interesting to you. So how about a, a slide here? Slide? I'm obviously supposed to get this slide myself, wait a minute. Whoops. Okay, this is, um, this is a really early sculptural installation. It's called Ante Room, and it's from about 1974. And um, this sort of, sort of um, temporary installations that, um, that are sort of sensation driven is sort of like one aspect of the early works that I was doing. The other aspect, which is what Elise was talking about, are um, I was working with um, one-of-a-kind handmade books of um, collages. This is called this book is called Braille Book, and it's from 1973 or somewhere thereabout, and it's all sort of black pages, and it has a secret compartment that's hollowed out of a Braille Reader's Digest, which has a piece of black mail underneath. Um, my earliest sort of collages I've always dealt with. My works are really thematically consistent. This is a, a, a really early collage from about 1971, which is just made from an envelope and a sort of pin-up photo of Alexis Smith. And uh, this is a, a recent collage from a couple of years ago called um, Gander. And uh, you can see that the, from the technical point of view, it's a little bit more sophisticated, but from a sort of um, content or a thematic point of view, it's really largely the same. Uh, I think my works are really um, consistent in the sense that I'm really interested in, in found material, I'm interested in Hollywood, I'm interested in culture, I'm interested in sort of like the mythology of American culture. But what I would think is the most sort of interesting thing about me is that I'm not really hung up on what kind of materials I work with. I'm really willing to work with anything. And I'm also not hung up about being an artist as opposed to being a designer. I'm willing to, you know, do design projects and whatever. I'm, you know, I do posters and books and stuff like that too. Um, this is a piece called um, an, a real early sort of installation from the late 70s um, called Autumn Sonata that was just in a storefront and it went on when it got dark and it's a it's a turntable with a with a changing colored light and a cut out of Fred and Ginger and it was just one of those sort of things that you came upon on the street in downtown LA with no explanation um, it has a sort of Hollywood sort of in the 30s and 40s kind of quality one of the one of the um, writers that I was particularly interested in was Raymond Chandler, who's a, a famous detective writer from the 40s. And um, much of my work is, is, is text-driven or has, has quotes. And I'm gonna show you a couple of simple collages called Chandlerisms from the late 70s. And I can't read them, so I'm gonna have to try to remember the name, the, uh, <laughs> the text was, this one is, it was a blonde. It was a blonde to make a bishop kick a hole in a stained glass window. And um, this is, I was just experimenting with trying to make the frames go along with the, um, add an image, add to the image themselves. Um, let's see. Great gulfs of nothing. Thank you very much. I can't read it from here. Did you guys hear that? Yeah? No? I just, no, you have to say it again. Our eyes met across great gulfs of nothing. This is a, um, let's see. 
This is a, a sort of narrative collage from the late 70s, and I did a lot of narrative collages. I'm only going to show you one um, because I started doing room size installations basically to, um, to relate these narrative collages to um, a space and sort of bring the physical aspects of the installations I was doing together with my collages. And um, this one, I think I can give you the, um, the images from left to right are a Band-Aid, a uh, puff of cotton, um, uh, a little kind of Jesus Saint sticker, I can't remember which one, a sand dollar, a piece of embroidery, some caps, and a, um, and a burned out match. Um, I felt a little better, but very little. I needed a drink. I needed a lot of life insurance. I needed a vacation. I needed a home in the country. What I had was a hat, a coat, and a gun. I put them on and went out. Okay, this is, a, this is my first sort of um, painted gallery installation from about 1981. It was called Raymond Chandler's Los Angeles. And all these collage things on the wall are, um, are pieces that have Raymond Chandler texts. And it's painted, and there's a sawdust floor, which smelled really good. And this is another detail of that piece with, with um, um, sort of 40s road, road signs and collage dollar bills on the wall. OK, this is a piece called Burma Shave Number 1. Hello, Hollywood, goodbye farm. It gave McDonald that needed charm, Burma shave. And it's variously installed with perspective palm trees or perspective telephone poles, depending on the setting, and a bale of hay. Um, my first installation that actually was sophisticated enough to require a blueprint was for the a show at the site show at the County Museum in 1981, and I show you this blueprint because it was actually drawn by Gary Page when he was a student. Um, this piece is called Cafe, and it's all made of little incremental collages that look Chinese, but they're really stuff from the dime store. And uh, it's a whole um, sort of fake Chinese free-for-all. Um, this is a, a detail. One of the neat things that I still like about this room is that the, the sheetrock was painted, and then the mud was tinted and, and over the top of it. So it had a kind of like a, a sort of domino pattern throughout. And then the images were painted on the wall. And then there were collages over the top. And it was very um, busy. And um, this, is the, this is the back side of the, of the, um, the moon door. And um, it was exposed um, studs painted red. So it was sort of a. Um, a little nod to Frank. Um, I used to work for Frank. Actually, I worked for Frank when I got out of school, which was really, I don't know, which was like a, it was like a miracle. I was working for, a, for an insurance company, and I happened to um, get recommended for a job as an assistant model maker, and, uh, which I'll tell you how that happened someday. OK, um, that's sort of these installations that I was just showing you just kind of get you in the mood here. Um, those were all temporary installations for galleries and museums and stuff. And believe me, there were a whole lot more that I didn't show you. But there were a lot of those in the late 70s and early 80s. And um, this is my first um, permanent commission, which is, was for this savings and loan called Unity Savings. And this is a um, collage. Um, and the text is, I can't replace our ideals, but I'll buy you a new watch when we get to Shanghai which is actually a quote from Shanghai Express. And this piece is called Starlight. And um, all the, it has a whole series of collages, which are shadow figures in lighted train windows, but obviously they're paintings. But, and they're all collaged onto. And each one of them has a, um, has a text from a different train movie. And, um, but the best thing about this piece from the from the point of view of being a primer on public art is that 
as you can see in the left side of the, um, the slide, the ramp goes off downhill. It's like a wheelchair ramp. Can you imagine what this wall looked like when it was white and it had like this ramp running off at a diagonal on the bottom? This was like the ugliest wall of the universe. And the, the train in perspective solved the problem and totally hid the wheelchair ramp in addition to um, producing this stellar artwork here. Um, Anyway, this piece um, actually belongs to me now because I had to buy it back from the Resolution Trust um, when the savings and loan went under. And let that be a lesson to you. I'm not, I'm jammed here. Okay, now what? Okay, the next slide. Okay, this is a this is a, a quote actually from uh, from Double Indemnity, which is um, they're not going to hang you, baby. They're not going to hang you because you're going to do it, and I'm going to help you. And just another one of these um, train collages. And she has an insurance advertisement uh, matchbox match cover and a cross on her collage onto her. It's not working. Um, this is a um, just a shot from the um, from the rear door, and uh, showing you how the um, the painting wraps around the door. And if you look at the if you stand at 45, that beam goes into perspective. Uh, what are we going to do about this? Are you going to just hand switch them? Yeah. That was a yes. Okay. Um, next. Okay, this is really the ugliest building in the known universe. Um, this, is, uh, this is a before photo of um, one of the sort of, one of the, this is the largest painted installation I ever did. And, um, and it cured me of, of wanting to do big permanent installations um, with paint. Um, but anyway, uh, this is the, um, the Keeler Grand Foyer of DeVos Hall which is the, um, back up, you're going too fast, you which is the, um, the uh, performing arts facility of Grand Center, which is the uh, convention center of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now you know how I got the key to the city here. Um, anyway, this place is, they actually had to light this place in order to take this picture because it was so dark. Um, in this place, uh, and it was it was olive green. It had orange carpeting, and it was totally dark, and it was completely confusing in terms of its circulation. And to get into this actually very nice theater with really nice acoustics. Um, next, please. Next, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, it. It was one of those projects where the problem with doing a painted project as opposed to doing something that's more architectural is that the tendency is to just keep going, right? I mean, because it's so easy to just paint over anything that's ugly that this project became a, you know, like 6,000 square feet of painted surfaces by the time it was done. It's a, um, it's a, a three floor project which is based on the um, metaphor of the Grand River because they were very, the city was very specific of wanting to have um, site-specific imagery. And um, next please. So at, at the top level, the river comes zigzagging down and they're giant like male and female faces which are sort of like pictographs which represent sort of um, the Grand, Rad Grand River runs through the center of Grand Rapids, and that's sort of like its most distinguishing geographical characteristic is that it's bisected by this river. So it was a pretty obvious metaphor. Um, anyway, the faces are sort of, you know, tragedy, comedy, male, female, female before, after. The one on the, the left side, the male, is sort of like the original Grand Rapids, and um, it sort of has... Uh, you know, boats and farms and stuff, and the female face is sort of more composed of cars and freeways and whatever 
next please, you have a detail. Okay, there's the, the sort of pictograph with the boats and the hills and the farm here. And um, next please. Thank you. So now you can see three floors. The next, at the second level, the, um, the painting comes down and becomes an enormous um, grand piano. And then at the um, bottom level, it becomes theater, more traditional sort of um, uh, deco theater motifs that are based on water. Um, next, please. Um, and then underneath uh, the stairway, there's a sort of seating area grotto where the column becomes a tree. And um, there are, um, these are big five foot tall sequin collages using traditional Indian floral motifs that also look very deco, that have something like 20,000 sequins on them. And uh, one of my TAs at UCLA glued those things on and I don't think she ever spoke to me again after that. <laughs> Um, next, please. Um, this is uh, this is the um, we call this the eddy, and it's basically a combination of Indian motifs and also piano keys, um, which swirls around the central column of the staircase. And all the all the columns are marbleized with plaster and and faux painting, and. Um, and so the columns themselves sort of become like rocks and the sort of central stairway sort of becomes a, a metaphor for the rapids of the Grand, if you squint your eyes. Um, let's see, there are also a number of collages. There are, um, there are 30 copper framed sort of abstract piano-like collages that are hung onto the, um, onto the keyboard. Next, please. Um, there's a big dancing shoe and then collages and then a top hat at the other end and then there's about, like I said, there's about 20 of these copper framed collages at the second level. Now, one of the reasons the picture, the painting has to be so blue is because I was stuck with the orange carpeting and, um, and because the colors were com complementary to each other, um, it was less I mean, it's another one of those things like the wheelchair ramp. The fact that the carpeting was orange was like a really big problem. And the only way to make the orange not noticeable was basically to have the image be largely blue, um, which is something that looks weird in slides, but when you're in there, it really, it's something that you don't notice that much. Um, next, please. Um, these are a couple of, of copper framed, um, oil painted sort of abstractions which are based on piano keys and they're all collaged and um, they have they have quotes that are largely from vaudeville and songs and stuff from the 20s and 30s which was a real a real heyday of Grand Rapids um, I think this one is like a Will Rogers quote or something like I don't know opera but I know common sense and the commoner it is the better I like it um, next please Oh, actually, I probably gave you the wrong quote, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, um, this is also another, this is another part of the eddy coming down to the main marquee, which is actually a weird shaped um, a projection booth shape at the, at the lower level. Next, please. And uh, we, it is, okay. Thank you. Um, Anyway, this is pretty straightforward. It looks like a, a sort of movie marquee, whatever, and it also has the identifies the 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 people for whom the um, space is named, and also the people who are putting up the money for this piece. Mm. Okay, now I'll show you some um, some installation shots, which I just happen to. Um, you guys will have to watch the focus up there because I can't tell the marquee. Um, these sorts are kind of, kind of dark, but they they are about projecting the image, the, the images and stuff, and charcoaling them onto the walls. And the next step, when the columns are being marbleized, and the, we used a lot of um, traditional sort of decorative painting techniques, like rag rolling and stuff like that. And I worked with them, this friend of mine, who's a who's a really excellent fine art painter named Richard Sedevy, um, who 
for many years made his living as a scenic painter at uh, CBS, and he did a lot of the really complicated finishes and stuff. I had a, a huge crew of about 12 people, and it took three months to paint this thing. And uh, this is the piano keyboard under control. I wanted you to see what it looked like when it was really filthy and depressing. And it was really hot. It was in the middle of the hottest summer they ever had, and they wouldn't turn the air conditioning on for us. It was literally like as close to hell as I ever hoped to come. Um, this is the this is adjusting the pattern for the um, for the eddy before we projected it onto the overhead soffit. And um, actually, the guy who's working on the pattern and who did a lot of the architectural patterns and stuff like that is um, Mike Kiley, who um, went to school here. Mo most of my assistants have actually, over for many years, been from SciArc, um, which is just, it's not really a co coincidence. When I went to college, I sort of fell in with artists, and when I grew up, I sort of fell in with architects. Um, here's another. This is painting the uh, sort of the, the priming coat um, the, the keyboard and the shoe and the top hat and whatever had texture coats underneath so that they were dimensional, and that's what this is. There's more piano keyboard. This is um, a Rich Sedevi painting fake tile motifs um, onto the fronts of these um, I don't even know what those things are called. Fascia, I think they're called. And uh, there were some places where we actually did what's called Spanish tile, which is fake tile made out of joint compound that's dried and sanded and filled in and then painted. OK, now, um, I sort of laid on the couch for a couple of years after that one. <laughs> and then uh, this one, this about 1986, I uh, was asked to be involved in a project for MacArthur Park, which was sort of, um, MacArthur Park is downtown across from Otis, and it used to be a really nice area, and it's been, um, it's a much rougher, poorer part of the city than it used to be. Uh, it's, a bunch of artists were brought together in hopes that a public art program could be used to sort of, um, bring a little, resuscitate the neighborhood somewhat, and um, issues of, of lighting and uh, different things could be addressed, and by, you know, focusing attention on the park and doing art there and whatever, it could, you know, be made to be a little nicer, safer area. Um, this is a, a sort of shot of the, the lake in MacArthur Park, the way it used to be, and you can see the, the West Lake um, Theater sign, which I think. Okay, my, um, I propose to do some, um, some monuments, some sort of mini monuments in the, in the park, which would have Raymond Chandler quotes in them. And the images for them were intentionally sort of cross-cultural, recognizable images, a dancing couple, a suitcase, um, a general, a couple of boxers. The, um, the crazy of a, as a pair of waltzing mice is actually a terrazzo medallion that I think is still there. It was destroyed and then put back and whatever. Um, the bronze suitcase is actually the nicest piece, and it, it was destroyed, but I'll show you in the slide. Uh-oh, I'm jammed again. What's wrong with these things? Is the same one? This one's working now? No, you think I have a bad vibe here? <laughs> no? We have a glitch? Okay, um, this is a, this is, looks like a bum suitcase, but it's actually a bronze suit, suitcase with bum patina on it. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And it says she sat in front of her princess dresser trying to paint the suitcases out from under her eyes, which is a, a Raymond Chandler quote. And um, this was a really authentic looking suitcase, even though it was bronze and it was fully attached. And, 
and people tried to sort of walk off with it, not knowing that it was bronze. Um, next, please. Um, this was a, a sort of a headstone piece. Mine was the better punch, but it didn't win the wristwatch. And uh, the um, there was the then there was the Trazo medallion, and um, then the fourth piece, which was um, which was going to be a um, a silhouette of MacArthur that said he had a jaw like a park bench. Um, I never was able to do because they ran out of money. Um, next, please. Now. As part of my project, um, and this is something which in recent times has become disputed, but as part of my project, um, uh, I arranged to have, um, Al Nodell and I arranged to have the, um, uh, the neon signs around the park to have five of them redone and relit as part of the, um, as part of the um, project. And um, since then, he's sort of redone these same signs as part of another project, which is sort of strange. But um, next, please. But I received a council manic civil service award for the sign relighting in 1986. I've actually been, I'm highly decorated as a sort of public artist designer, much more so than as an artist. <laughs> Um, next, please. Uh, this is another sort of um, memorial type piece, um, which was done for Art Park um, in about 1986 or seven. And um, it's a picture of Marilyn Monroe where her hair becomes Niagara Falls. And it's a quote from the movie Niagara, which is nothing in the world could keep it from going over the edge. And um, that's the Niagara River in the background. Um, next, please. This is probably my most famous sort of visible um, artwork. It's called Men Seldom Make Passes at Girls Who Wear Glasses. And um, it's, a, it's about a 10-foot tall head of Marilyn Monroe with um, collage eyeglasses that are sort of like sunglasses, which make her somewhat incognito. And inside the these eyeglasses are um, are backgrounds of football players making passes and collage elements. And um, this was originally done as an installation for the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and it was it's been realized a number of times since then. And um, it was one of those pieces which arose in my head like fully formed, which I found these frames which were brown and had bullfighters in them. And as soon as I saw them, I knew they were going to become eyeglasses. And, um, but I had the most difficulty making a Marilyn that didn't look like Andy Warhol. And um, the problem was, was ultimately solved because um, of a picture in a, in a biography of RFK showing Marilyn Monroe incognito, and uh, that, became the, that became the defining element. Next, please. Um, the football player collages. Um, football is actually one of my primary, one, one of my real loves, and I, it does crop up frequently. This is a piece called The Perfect Couple. She could wrap him around her pinky, but he could pick her up with his. And uh, this is from a series called Jane, which is using, using images of women from my childhood. Um, next. I'm just throwing this in as a si aside because football is going to play into one of my projects. Here's another, um, here's just a, a shot of, of trying to get the, um, the glasses perfectly um, located on the, on the background, which is a, a critical aspect of the piece. Next, please. Um, this piece has to be sort of focused twice, but this piece was purchased by the La Jolla Museum to um, be part of the new, um, part of the axe line court of the new Venturi edition of the La Jolla Museum. So this is a more or less permanent home for this piece as of last March. That's sort of a, a sort of I was sort of influenced by Venturi when I started um, doing installations. I was 
very engaged by his idea of how the um, the context changes the work. So it's sort of ironic that it, this piece would wind up in a Venturi building. Um, next, please. Uh, here's another picture of it in the, um, in my Mocha retrospective. Next, and these collages on the back wall are from the same period, and they're from a series of works called Jane, which are about images of women like, you know, Tarzan and Jane and Dick and Jane and Calamity Jane and what have you. I'm just going to show you a few because it's important that I, that I show you both the collage work that I do and the sort of installation work because there's a point where these, these directions diverge very greatly. Um, next, please. This is a piece called Asphalt Jungle, and it belongs to Mocha. Um, I think it's, can somebody read that? I can't. All right, which is obviously a line from Tarzan. And um, these are just police targets that have been painted and collaged. And they're pretty tall. They're about four feet tall, five feet tall. Next, please. Um, this is a piece called um, Calamity and Deadwood, and it's also a piece from Jane. And so it gives you a little bit of an idea what Jane is like. Jane are, was the garbled attribute, attributes of all the sort of women of my childhood, Jane Mansfield and, you know, Dick and Jane and, and Tarzan and Jane. And, Jane Bowles and Jane Eyre and Jane Austen, et cetera, et cetera. And Jane is a slang word for woman. Next, please. Um, the, the Janes got me thinking about, um, you know, sort of fate and destiny. And this is a large installation of my lifetime collection of children's chairs, um, in, which is a collaborative piece that I did with the poet Amy Gersler. And uh, it has some rather amusing and also rather... Um, rather black um, text that deals with um, the fact that we all sort of start out fresh and we all start out the same and you can, you know, you go to school with people and, you know, the person that one person can become a movie star and one person can become a housewife and one person can become an axe murderer, you know what I mean? And you just, there's no way to look at children and know what's going to happen to them. Uh, and these are all very kind of battered and beat up children's chairs. Next, please. Um, this piece has been installed a number of places, and these slides are from Josh Bear Gallery in New York. Next, please. Now, you, since I, I usually read this, but since I can't see the screen very well, you guys can read this. This is a piece of, um, well, actually, maybe I can read it. Never in debt, never repented, never noticed, never bested, never satisfied, never relax, never said die, never let his hair down, never calls home, never sober, never recovered, never comfortable in the presence of others, never questioned, never, I can't read that, never asked, never confessed, never hit a false note, never kept track, never, never looked up, never appreciated, never complained, never saw what all the fuss was about, never knew what hit him, never lost sight of the fact that he was living on borrowed time, which just gives you a sort of sense of the poetry of Amy's writing and the sort of, um, um, the kind of quality of the, of the text of the piece. And there's also an artist book which was designed with um, graphics designer Jeff Keaty. That's actually a really nice book that goes with this installation. Um, next, please. Um, this is actually another piece from Jane, but it kind of leads into a whole series of work that I did um, using uh, material from Kerouac based on cars and called On the Road. But this is, a, this is an actual piece using an image of Francis Farmer um, as Calamity Jane called Hell on Wheels. I just wish they would leave me alone and let me go to hell by my own route. Next, please. A whole series of collage works based on um, 
Jack Kerouac's On the Road. This one's called The Holy Road. Next, please. This is a large piece. It's about four foot tall and seven foot wide. And uh, he drove like a fiend and never rested. It's called Running on Empty. And um, all these... All these Kerouac pieces have a, some, something of a, um, a sort of religious, spiritual sort of aspect of the, um, the Kerouac book is sort of a, peril, is sort of a parable for um, going to the promised land. And the main character's name is Salvadori Paradise. It's a very sort of, it's very kind of obvious um, a metaphor. It's one of those books that when you read it, it in high school, it seems very um, innocent and I mean, it seems sort of kind of, sort of um, what kind of about juvenile delinquents or something, but when you read it later, it seems very, um, very innocent. Um, next, please. This is a 57 Chevy Fender painted in a sad red dusk. It was goodbye. And it's called Adios. And it's a, it's a trompe. Loy painting that um, was done with this friend of mine who's an illustrator named Lucia Vinograd. And some of those images are painted on, and some of them are the natural rust spots from this thing having been sanded from a million different colors. And it's really a big, heavy fender. Um, next, please. I'm kind of showing these collages because I want to emphasize the obvious qual the obvious sort of object physical qualities of these things because we're about to diverge into design here. Um, this is a piece called The Holy Road from the same period, which is the late 80s in, or maybe 1990. Um, it's called Rocky Road, and it's about six foot tall from the, just the wood pieces themselves. And they are, um, they're not found objects, they're, they're made to look like found objects. Next, next please. This is a, a large piece, it's about 10 feet across and it's called Jack. Um, partly for Jack Kerouac and partly for the Union Jack. And it's one of a number of pieces that I've done that have snakes in them because I sort of became obsessed with snakes for a while um, as a result of doing this um, on the road series. Next, please. This is a, a piece which was a, a big painted commission for the Brooklyn Museum. It's called Same Old Paradise. And it's a, um, a 22 foot by 66 foot painted backdrop of an orange, sort of an orange label format. It's actually a many sort of orange, orange trees converging to five perspective points, and it's a it's a paradise Garden of Eden parable where the road comes down and becomes the snake, and the oranges hang in the upper left as the as the Garden of Eden, and it's quite a huge piece in it. The canvas part was painted in the um, in the scenic shop at UC of UCLA and uh, the large collages are billboard fragments that are collaged um, and then they're about five foot tall and 30 feet long I'll show you the individual collages next please this is the collage which is sort of a condensation of the complete spirit of On the Road in, in eight segments. Uh, next, please. The road was straight as an arrow. Next. Moths smashed our windshield. And there are arrows sticking through that piece. They stick out a couple of feet into the arm. Next. I was rushing through the world without a chance to see it. And that elbow is sitting on a, the armrest from an old car. Next. My eyes ached in nightmare day. That's a, a map with red lines that look sort of like bloodshot eyes. Next. 
I suddenly saw mm, the whole country. I can't read it from here. It, Pearl was there. The Pearl was there. Did you guys hear that? Uh, next, please. A fast car, a coast to reach, a woman at the end of the road. That's a beer fragment. Next, please. I looked greedily out the window. Next. Somewhere along the line, there'd be girls, visions, everything. Somewhere along the line, the pearl would be handed to me. That's an autographed baseball up in his hand up above. Anyway, this is quite a large collage on billboard fragments. Next. Okay, you guys, we're coming into the home stretch here. Um, when I was, when I was um, installing this piece and I was staying in this friend of mine loft, loft in Soho and uh, I, had this, I had this dream about a snake that you could walk on and I had, a, um, I had been asked to do a, a project for the Stewart Collection at UCSD, at University of Southern Cal of California at San Diego, um, which has an incredible collection of, of commissioned contemporary sculpture, outdoor sculpture. Anyway, um, next please. So this is, the, um, this is the rendering for the snake path at UCSD. Um, in its proposal stage, which is um, which is a um, ten foot wide, five hundred and sixty foot long um, slate and concrete path that leads from the central library down a hill to um, the engineering plaza, and when this proposal was made, the hillside didn't exist. The hillside was formed by making an addition to the library where they took the dirt out from under and put an underground addition and then bermed up the dirt and then that made a hillside and changed the, the grade significantly from a, what, was, what was originally a parking lot at the lower level. Um, next please. This is the uh, this is the same view as the as the rendering. You can see the library up in the upper right corner. Next, please. This is a construction photo of the concrete pad for the for the snake itself, and the snake was done first, and then the um, the connecting sidewalks and walkways and stuff were um, were added. Um, Next, please. This is the um, this is this is the tiling process. There are um, there's seven thousand pieces of slate in three colors. That um, each one of them is cut with seven cuts out of a out of a square piece of slate. The three colors of slate had to be ordered from, you know, different places around the world. There's a, a yellowish and a, um, a dark gray and a sort of pinkish green. Um, the, you can see the wet concrete sand base under the, under the slate here. Uh, next, please. The, pattern is a non-repeating pattern and the um, expansion joints are worked into the pattern so that the, the layout of the pattern and the had to be exactly perfect because I mean the concrete work had to be exactly perfect if um, if it wasn't perfect then the um, it wouldn't fall it wouldn't fall in the, you know, within the pattern, and the pattern would swing off to one way or another. So the, the underpinnings of the snake had to be perfect. Um, next, please. 
There's the snake just when it was on a dirt hill. Next, please. The um, head of the snake is inlaid into the, um, into the plaza of the library, and then there's a loop that has a sort of mini Garden of Eden in it, and then further down the hill, there's a granite book, which is a, a copy, a seven-foot-tall copy of Milton's Paradise Lost. Next, please. There's a, a detail of the, of the head and its, um, its red granite tongue. Now, I, I, should, I need to, uh, at this point, credit um, Christine Lawson, who teaches here, who, um, who has worked for me on this project and most of the architectural projects they're going to see. And uh, much of the drawings and stuff of all these projects are her handiwork here. Um, next, please. There's a, a detail of the, um, of the head of the snake which was made from a full-size cut. The cuts were made from a full-size paper template. Next, please. This is the um, copy of Paradise Lost, which even has its Dewey Decimal number from the, from the old library. Next, please. Um, this is a, a detail of the of the snake's tail, which once the adjoining um, pathways and stuff were poured, looks like it's um, wrapping around the sidewalk. Uh, it took many years. The, the bulk of this project, which took six years, was in the planning stage because the the whole concept had to be integrated into the master plan and. We had to get a, a variance from Title 24 because it couldn't. It was too. The path was too steep, and um, it was basically um, a long process getting the okay to build it. It actually was only a year in the in the actual construction. I think. Next, please. This is the um, the book. And the, there's a quote on it, which is, and wilt thou not be loath to leave this paradise, yet shalt possess paradise within thee happier far, which is sort of the metaphor of the university as a kind of, um, kind of protective paradise environment where um, your compensation for getting kicked out of paradise is having the sort of knowledge to... Uh, help you in a more threatening world. Um, next, please. Um, I wanted to um, show you so, sort of um, go back. We're going to go back a few years here. And I'm going to show you um, some images that eventually metamorphosed into something permanent. Um, this is a commissioned installation for House and Garden magazine from 1981. And it's called New World. and um, I, uh, I met Martin Filler, who used to be an editor of House and Garden magazine as a, at a dinner party and uh, back in the old days when House and Garden was pretty conservative. And he, he told me I could do an installation from the magazine as long as it had furniture in it. And um, so this is a, this is a piece that's, out, that's one of those maps, right, of the, that's made out of wallpaper and fabric and matching linoleum. And um, there's a, you know, a ship in in Boston Harbor and a and a uh, an elk in Alaska and a you know a rug off South America and there's there's fruit at Cuba and and a silk pillow in New Orleans and a cactus in the Southwest and um, so this is a sort of like little Trump Loy furniture room here um, next please. Um, this is what the room really looked like. It only existed in the camera. Um, it only existed through the lens, and it was really just like a giant headache to make it because, because, of, the, because of that. Um, 
seems like many of these things have are those things that seem like they really were seem like a really great idea you know looks really good on paper and then you like set out to try to actually make it a reality and that's been one of those things that's kind of persisted through the installation aspects of my work for many years um, next please then that map image resurfaced again um, in these proposals um, for the Miami or airport which were never realized. This is a collaborative um, proposal with R.M. Fisher, who's a, a sculptor who did the, I did sort of, I'm sort of responsible with sort of the background part of this, and he's responsible for this big, the big um, uh, airplane clock. And um, we basically were proposing a, a sort of, um, a return to the kind of romance of, of travel images that used to dominate the original Miami airports and whatever. Um, next, please. This is a, um, a big a bronze globe bar. Um, we went through two complete proposal phases for different concourses of the Miami airport and um, neither of them was realized. Um, next. However, eventually I did get a chance to do the giant map. Um, this is a catwalk view of the terrazzo in the south lobby of the LA Convention Center. Um, another six-year project that ran more or less concurrently with the snake path. Uh, next, please. Um, this is a, a drawing of the um, of the map of the floor um, in the and it shows the this strange shaped um, footprint, which is an orthogonal grid that runs across the top, and then the radial grid that that forms the sort of cone shape, and the lines of the um, geometry of this. Origi of the original drawing sort of in you know suggested to me the sort of you know lines of a map and um, this predict particular projection is unique because of its shape and also because it has the Pacific Rim at its center which very few maps have the most maps have the Atlantic Ocean at their center um, so this is a, a realistic projection it's just in a very strange shape I mean it's accurate um, but it's in an odd shape the three different tones represent three colors of terrazzo next please it's another overhead view of the building the building was um, done by pay Cobb Fried and and Jim Freed was the main design architect. Next, please. This is the um, a shot of the map being drawn onto the onto the concrete, and then next, please. And then the metal was meticulously bent with you know little pliers and whatever to conform to the details of the map. Next, please. And this is the final effect. The map is punctuated with um, these circular medallions that represent indigenous sort of ethnic designs from cultures around the rim. Next, please. And there are, uh, I think there's 20 of them, and they are all based on related motifs of the wave or the spiral. Next, please. There's a, a detail of a Maori medallion. You can see the the marble and and the chips in the in the terrazzo. Next, please. This is. Um, Central America. That's a Panamanian um, medallion. They're not. Um, there's no. There's no verbal indication or of what these things are. You have to orient yourself on this map by um, by your wits. 
Uh, next, please. And it's a pretty large scale map. It's one of those things where it's very, um, it's a scale that you never really encounter in the world um, because you can't see all the way across it unless you go up to another level. Next, please. This is the, um, this is what the in process looks like in the pouring of the medallions where the colors are poured individually and then they harden and then the whole thing is ground. Next, please. More medallions. This is Asia, the Asia coast. It's the Philippines on the right. Next, please. Um, this is a, a plan for the west lobby, which is the other end of the um, a connecting sort of bridge that goes across Pico. And these are two levels, and the colors are reversed in this drawing from just for the ease of, of producing the drawing. So there's a, the, there's a map of the Milky Way at the upper level, and then there's the, a piece of the earth and a piece of the moon at the lower level. Next, please. This is the, um, the Milky Way at the upper level. Next, please. Bird's eye view. Next, please. This is a, a terrazzo detail showing the sort of the lines of the constellations and the, the stars are actually correctly sort of coded by their magnitudes so that the small stars are yellow and the larger stars are white, or the larger meaning the brighter stars are white. Next, please. This is my favorite part, which is the moon at the lower level. Next, please. Um, we're going to just run briefly through this. I had one next, one other project that was built, um, that was not built, that sort of ran currently to these three things, which is a, um, a plaza project for Playhouse Square in Cleveland. Next, please. And uh, it was a, it was sort of based on on using theatrical motifs for a neighborhood that had old, um, reconditioned. Uh, vaudeville theaters, and they were trying to upgrade this this neighborhood. And this is a um, this is a proposal for a plaza, which would take some of the theater motifs and and do lighting and and do a paving pattern that was sort of based on the old theater carpeting, and put a piece of you know put a an actual sort of step down theater seating area at one end. Next, please. There's the, uh, this is a, a sort of bridge that runs across that's like a mezzanine balcony that to provide circulation at the bottom part there's a paving pattern that's sort of a floral theater carpeting motif. And uh, next please. And then there's an actual like theater, mini theater seating area with boxes for people to have their lunches and stuff. And this project was never built. And right now, they, they ultimately did one of the, a kind of a Harvard Square thing with a kiosk and some, some magazine stands and stuff. I was just there. Uh, next, please. Um, this is the last slide. My, I'm actually, as I said, I'm a big football fan. And my current project, which I'm sort of waiting to see the extent of it, is going to be um, uh, probably a terrazzo floor for the new sports arena at Ohio State. And um, this is a piece called All American. He never carried anything except for a football or a highball. Um, that's it, I think. Next. Now you guys should feel free to go and anybody who wants to ask a question can. Pardon me? 
Do I listen to Stardate? I listen to it sometimes. I listen to it out in the desert because we get, when we're out in the desert, we get radio from Las Vegas, and that's when it, uh, it, when it comes in. Sorry about the. Uh, Stardate is something that's on the radio where they talk about the position of the star. 